now for uh, 32 years. Uh, my wife, Karen, uh, I've known my wife since I was 11 years old. Since I was 11 years old, we used to throw rocks at each other. <laughs> and then we met as adults, and I looked at her and I said, kind of like what Adam said, oh, whoa, mom. We have, we have five adult children. I have uh, first four were all girls, and then uh, God finally blessed me, the fifth one, uh, which was 11 years after the fourth one, because I kept trying for the son, you know, and it was fun trying, uh, so I didn't mind the trying. Uh, and I finally uh, uh, got a son. And so what I'm going to share with you today is kind of what I have learned in regards to this institution um, called marriage. You know, because when I grew up, I, I, I grew up with pimps, hustlers, and drug dealers. So for, for me growing up, women were a tool to be used. Women were a means to an end. I, I, I had no idea, no concept, no value system about valuing a woman. And so when I got saved, and now I'm with this, I'm with this woman, and I had no idea on how to love her. I had no idea how to do this thing called marriage because I grew up in a community where nobody was married. The only, the only couple that I saw was on the Brady Bunch and Leave it to Beaver's dad. That was, that was all I saw in terms of this institution of marriage. So everything, when I got married, that I had to learn, I had to learn from the Lord. I had to go to the book, because I didn't have a template uh, to guide and direct me. I had to learn to go to the book. So what we want to do today is take a look at the book and find out what is it that God has provided for you and I as a template, a model in the book so that our marriages could be healthy and strong. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, Lord, for your word, because it is indeed life and health to all of our flesh. Lord, we're, we're, we're here as men, and God, you, you know our condition. You, you know our need, and what we really need at this moment is not to hear from Dave Jones, but we need to hear your spirit. We need to receive manna from heaven. So, Holy Spirit, we ask that you would now release and manifest all of your gifts of teaching, communication, exhortation, and conviction in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Amen. Marriage. What a theme. The blame game. Because oftentimes, when our marriages aren't working right, what do we do as men? We blame. We blame. Here's some foundational principles we need to understand about marriage. First of all, marriage is God's ideal, not man's. God is the author and the founder of the institution of marriage. In fact, it is the first institution that God established and created in the earth. Before the church, before government, the first thing God did was he established Marriage. Marriage is the foundation of the family. It is the foundational building block of any culture or any society. And as it relates to the institution of the local church, I am thoroughly convinced of this one foundational principle and is this. Strong marriages, strong families. Strong families, strong churches. Weak marriages, weak families. Weak churches. God has given the institution of marriage to convey to the world an image and model of his relationship with his people. If we look in the Old Testament, when God wanted to convey to Israel his, his long suffering, his commitment to his everlasting covenant, he told the prophet to go and to marry a prostitute. So as that prostitute was consistently unfaithful, he, he instructed the prophet to continually pursue her, to not give up on her. In fact, he had to go and purchase her from the slave block so that it could be an image of God's commitment to you and I. When the relationship of Christ in the church is portrayed to us in the New Testament, it's portrayed to us as Christ is married to the bride of the church. So today, what we want to do that's challenging and difficult is to look at scripture that we all read. We know the story. 
We've heard it over and over again. But I want to look at some old things that we've seen time and time again with the hopes of discovering and seeing something new in what is old. The biggest challenge for us as believers is to always have an open heart and an open mind as it relates to Scripture. So turn with me, if you will, if you have your Bible, we're going to look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Genesis chapter 3, we'll begin with verse 9 and 10. And here's God, God, God in the book of Genesis. He looks at the emptiness and the void and the chaos that's in the earth, and God speaks, and God speaks, and he creates an environment that's conducive for the pinnacle of his creation, which is man. And he places man in the garden. He gives man clear instruction. But like most of us as men, Adam blows it. And then God comes, and he comes to have a conversation with Adam to discover or rather to help Adam discover where he is. And God says, it says, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? And so he, meaning Adam, said, Well, I, I heard your voice in the garden, and, and, and I was afraid because I was naked, and so I hid myself. And he said, Well, who, who, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, the woman that you gave to me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Where are you today? Men, where are your marriages, where is the relationship you have with your spouse? How is your home? Would, would your response be like Adam? And Adam said, well, Lord, it, listen, we blew it, but it ain't me. Notice what he says. Again, these are texts that we know, we see, but sometimes we can know it so well, it becomes so familiar that we lose the value of it. Watch what the text says. Adam replies. He says, God, it ain't my fault. You know whose fault it is, God? Not only is the woman, but it's the woman that you gave me. It ain't my fault, God. It's you and that woman, the one that you gave me. Who do you blame for the condition of your marriage? Who do you blame for the condition of your home? Listen, I've raised five teenagers. I had hair. When I got married, I did. They used to call me Wavy Davy. I had a lot of hair. <laughs> I know that our homes can be chaotic at times. I, I know that we could be in, committed to our marriage and yet feel like we have no control over what's happening in the environment of our home. That, 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 that our wives aren't submitting the way we want them to submit. Our kids aren't listening to the way we want them to listen. Our wives aren't spending the money the way we want them to spend the money. The order in the house isn't the way we want. And it's so easy and it's so tempting to say, God, it's not my fault. It's the woman and them rugrats that you gave me. But God's response to Adam is so critical here. In verse 17, God says this. Then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife. Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree 
which I command you, saying, you shall not eat. God puts the responsibility squarely in Adam's lap. Here's an operating principle for us to understand. The, the, the one responsible is the one accountable. The responsibility was given to Adam to care for and to tend. And because of Adam's failure of the responsibility of headship, God said, no, Adam, it's not the woman that's accountable. It's you because I made you responsible. Gentlemen, at the end of the day, Adam's sin is not because he was deceived. The woman was deceived. Adam sinned because he failed to lead. Because he failed to lead. Adam failed to exercise his headship over his wife, the serpent, and the garden. As men, we, we, we get confused sometimes about this whole headship thing. And I want to have a conversation with you with the balance of my time, which I anticipate by my spidey senses, about 20 minutes, 25 minutes. All right. I want to talk to you about headship. Because it's Adam's failure of headship that was the means of God holding him accountable. In the scriptures, God does not blame Eve. When Christ comes, God says that Christ is the second Adam. It says by the first Adam, all of us were cast into sin. So God lays the blame solely and squarely at Adam's feet because Adam failed the test of headship. And headship is different from dictatorship. See, many, many of us as men, we want to dictate in our home. We come to men's conferences and we hear, we hear messages like this and we start going home and barking out orders. And I learned a long time ago, because if you ever met my wife, the last thing you want to do is bark out an order. <laughs> that, ain't, that, ain't, that, that ain't going right. That, that, no, no, that ain't, that, that ain't happening. I want to explore with you and have a conversation with you about this issue of headship. Because headship is made up of four crucial elements. And these elements are essential if we are going to have fruitful, successful, godly marriages. And, and I'm, I'm not talking about just surviving marriage. Because there's so how, how many of you have been married here more than five years? Okay? Now keep your hands up. Ten, more than 10 years. More than 20 years. More than 30 years. Now, those who have that longevity, there have been some times in those years, right, where your marriage didn't thrive. You kind of survived. Oh, if you've been married for a while, you won't go through them seasons, trust me. It's kind of like being on the roller coaster where you get in, you're strapped in, and you just hang on for the ride. That's not God's perfect will, gentlemen. God's perfect will isn't that our marriages survive, that you say, I survived for 32 years. <sighs> we made it. God, God's will is that our marriages thrive because God has a divine purpose and intent for this institution called marriage. And there are things about his nature and there are things about his church that he wants conveyed to the world through this institution that you and I are committed to called marriage. And in order for that to be revealed, these four elements of headship must be consistently and relentlessly pursued and exercised. The first principle I want to talk to you about is, is the principle of assignment. 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 Look at the text. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15. I forgot to warn you, I am a Bible teacher. I love reading from the word of God. Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 says this, Then the Lord God took the man and put him in the, put him in the garden of Eden to do what? To tend it and to keep it. Watch, watch this. 
Verse 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you should not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. So the first principle of headship that Adam failed at is in understanding what his assignment was. God assigned him to care for and to tend the garden and to stay away from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. My question to you is, what is your assignment? What are you called by God to do? Not only what are you called by God to do, but here is a question that was asked of me when my wife and I finally decided to obey God and get married, because I didn't tell you in the beginning, we shacked up for three years before we got married. All of our kids were at our wedding except, except the fifth one. We always jokingly tell him, you're the only legitimate one we got. <laughs> but the question, the question that was asked me was this. What is the divine purpose that God has for you and, your, you and Tracy to accomplish together that he cannot accomplish with you being apart. What is the purpose that God has brought you and your wife together to accomplish? That if the two of you were apart, there's no way for that thing to be accomplished. What is your assignment? Your assignment isn't necessarily your career, gentlemen. Your, 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 your assignment isn't necessarily to move into the suburbs and to get that nice house with the white picket fence and to get his and hers BMWs. That's not the divine assignment. What is your divine assignment? Here's why assignment is so important, because once you understand your divine assignment, it gives you your identity. It gives you your identity. Adam's identity is contained in his divine assignment. His identity is he is a nurturer. He is a steward. He is to care for. His functionality came out of that. Now watch this. Genesis chapter 3, verse 18. Are you with me? Amen. Now watch this, watch this. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. It is not good that man should be alone. And because of this assignment that I've given him, I'm going to make him a helper who will help him with the assignment. See, gentlemen, when we don't know what our divine assignment is, we diminish and limit the capacity of our wives to be a helpmate. Let me say that again. I think that might have went... When we don't know our assignment and we don't have our divine identity, I am not talking about the universal positional realities and truths of our identity in Christ. I am talking about the specific will for which God snatched you out of the world for. You were called according to his purpose and his plan. And when we don't know our assignment, we don't have identity. And when we don't have identity, our wives can't be a helpmate. Eve was given to Adam to help Adam fulfill his assignment. And when we don't know our assignment and our wives can't help us, here's what begins to happen. Our marriages have no compass. What's guiding and directing us? After we attend church every Sunday, now what? What's our goal? What's our purpose? What defines our yes and our no? What dictates what we do with our resources? What dictates what we put into our children and how we direct our children? Without that knowledge, here's what happens in our marriages. Our marriages boil down to being logistical partnerships. 
And if you've been married for a long time, you understand exactly what I'm saying, right? And particularly if you got kids, here's what happens when there is no divine awareness of assignment, identity, where my wife can be a helpmate. Life becomes this. Okay, honey, I'm picking them up at what time? Okay, you dropping them off at what time? Okay, we're going to do this. Okay, we're going to pay what bills at this time? We're going to pay what bills at what time? And now our interaction isn't based upon anything that God is intentionally purposing to produce out of our lives and our marriage. We're just logistical partners. And that's why so many marriages end up in divorce after the kids are gone. Because once the kids leave, there's no more logistical requirements, and they look at each other and go, wow, I don't even know you. Apart from having to do scheduling and planning and organizing, I don't know you. There's nothing that connects us. And when you don't know who you are as a man, you force your wife to find her identity outside the scope of your marriage. And I know, I know, I know, I know. I know we in the Me Too movement. I know women empowerment. I know equality of the sexes. I get it. But I'm not talking about societal norms. I'm talking about the book. Assignment. Creates identity. Your wife is only going to discover who she really is, not because she's taking that MBA course at night. She's going to really discover who God created her to be through the lens and the context of your partnership in the institution of marriage, pursuing the divine assignment and purpose of God that gives you identity. Am I making sense? The next thing about headship is we have assignment and identity. And the next thing about headship is vulnerability. Because in all of these things, Adam failed. The next thing is vulnerability. Part of what, what, what involves our ability to lead and to guide is we got to know our sign. We have to know who we are so our wife can know who they are, and then we have to be vulnerable. Look what um, Genesis 2.25 says. It says, and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not what? They were both naked. I knew this guy named Joe Peavy when I was in the corporate world. He was from Georgia, and he had a differential between naked and naked. He used to say naked just means you ain't got no clothes on. Naked is you got no clothes on and you're about to do something. They were naked, both of them. And watch this, they weren't ashamed. This speaks to transparency and vulnerability. There was an openness about their relationship. There, there, there was no need to hide anything. You know, the American myth of malehood, you know, John Wayne, you know, if I get hurt, I'll take out my own bullet. Stick the knife in the fire, carve it out, seal it up, and pour some whiskey on it, because I'm a man. <laughs> right? And without us, without, us, without us being aware, we grow up with that model of manhood. And what happens is we, 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 we are sensitive towards our wives in the recruitment process. Right? real sensitive in the recruitment process, right? And then once we get married, you know, we stop making ourselves vulnerable. We start being, we stop being naked before them. We stop being transparent. We stop talking to them about our fears. We, we, we stop talking to them about our vulnerabilities. We, we, we won't admit to them when our feelings are hurt. And what it begins to happen is there's a fig leaf that gets overgrown. See, the fig leaf God gave them was to cover up their sin. See, their nakedness had always been there, but they weren't aware of the nakedness till sin came along. 
See, what sin causes us to do is to try to hide our weaknesses from one another. Y'all know what that looks like on Sunday morning. You come in church, right? And, and somebody says, how you doing, brother? And you just fought with your wife all the way to church. All the way to church. Y'all, y'all in the parking lot cussing each other out. You walk in, how you doing? Praise the Lord, bless, bless hallelujah. <laughs> right? If, if we are going to have the type of marriages that God wants, gentlemen, I, I, I think part of our headship requirement is for us to learn to be vulnerable with our wives again, to be naked and not ashamed, not ashamed to tell our wives our fears and our hurts and our disappointments and our worries and when our feelings are wounded and when we're crushed, when we've been beat up in the world and come home and say, baby, I just need you to hold me. Instead of going and hanging out with the guys and trying to macho and tough it out. See, because when we think about intimacy, right? Come on, guys, let's just be real. When we think about intimacy, we think about sex, right? Because for us, we could be fighting with our wife all week. Come Friday, hey, baby. <laughs> what you, you want to do something? What you, right? We can go from fighting to loving like it, 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 it just... One of the reasons, gentlemen, why there's a problem with your sex in your marriage, and can I just be real, and you ain't getting it like you used to get it, is because you stopped being vulnerable. You see, women have a need for affection. Women have a need. We don't need it. Women have a need for affection, and intimacy with them is more emotional than physical. And when I stop being willing to be naked and not ashamed before my wife, I'm really telling her, I don't love you. I'm really saying to her, I don't trust you with my heart. And that's where the distance grows. And that's why you don't get it like you used to get it. You get that duty booty. <laughs> this is the men's conference, right? We, we, we can talk, right? How many people know what I'm talking about? I see. I, 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 I ain't out of place. All right. The last principle that's so important for us, the last principle that's important for us. So Adam failed in the issue of headship, and headship has to do with understanding our assignment. What is it that God has called us to do? And when we understand what God has called us to do, it gives us identity, and it gives our wives identity, because God gave our wives to us to be a helpmate to help us do what we were called to do. The third element of headship has to do with vulnerability and understanding that intimacy is about emotional vulnerability and transparency and being willing to be naked before my wife and having no shame. And the fourth element of our headship has to do with protection. Protection. Look at Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. So here, here, here's the serpent come creeping up on Eve, and he starts the process. And he said, you know, God, God ain't really say don't, don't, don't. He said, no, she said, no, no. God said, don't, 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 don't touch it, don't eat it, because the day that we eat of it, you surely die. And they said, nah, you, 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 you ain't really going to die. Not really. He, he, he's just trying to keep something from you because he knows in the day that you eat of it, you'll be like him, knowing good and evil. And watch your response. And so when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, in a tree desirable to make one wise. Those are the three foundational sins of the world. Lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. The three things that Satan tried to tempt Jesus with in the wilderness. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life are of this world. And this world passes away. These are the same temptations that the enemy is constantly bringing to your home, your marriage, and your wife. It says, she took of its fruit and she ate it. Watch this now. She also gave to who? 
Who was where? She gave the who? And he was where? With her. Let me ask you something, gentlemen. Would you let somebody just roll up on your wife out of nowhere and just, would you? And just stand there and be like, wow, honey, you took that one like a champ. <laughs> right? No, you wouldn't. Here's Adam. The commandment and the instruction came directly to Adam. He is the one responsible because he is the one God made accountable. And when the temptation comes, he is standing right there and offers no protection. That's why God said, Adam, you heeded the voice of your wife. You knew exactly what I told you. And when the enemy came, he provided no protection for his wife. He didn't say, hold on, hold on, hold on, honey. This is exactly what God said. Because remember, Adam had dominion. Adam had authority. The relationship between the devil and man wasn't what it is post-fall where he is the God of this world, and through the weakness of sin in the flesh, he has dominion, control, and authority. Adam had all the power, all the juice, and he chose not to protect. And because he chose not to protect, she got deceived. Are you protecting your wife? What was the weapon that he needed to to, to, to deploy in order to protect Eve is the word. It was the word. He needed to remind her of what God said. Gentlemen, other than what you hear on Sundays, other than what you talk about in your men's small group, are you speaking the word in your home? Are you establishing biblical boundaries in your home, when you discern and sense lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, and pride of life is trying to find its way into your wife's heart. Are you protecting? Do you pray for your wife? And I'm not talking about this kind of prayer. Lord, you better do something with her. <laughs> Lord, Lord, change her mind. Lord, make her see it the way I see it. Are you praying? Are you employing spiritual protections and boundaries about your marriage? Gentlemen, if, if not, then our marriages will survive, but they won't thrive. Yes. Because the commandment in the instruction that came to him was nobody touch it. Everything else is for you, but not this. They could have eaten from, um, from the tree of life and lived forever. The reason why God banished them out of the garden, because after eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God said, man, if they eat of the tree of life, they will live forever. So we got to get them out. So here, 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 here's my question for you guys. Are you honest with yourself and say that you fulfilled these headship requirements? And, and listen, listen, guys, I'm teaching this stuff to you right now. I need help for this stuff. You, you can't do this stuff on your own. You, matter of fact, you try to do it on your own, you just mess it up and make it worse, right? If we're able to employ these disciplines of headship, we have the opportunity for God to create the type of environment in our home and marriages where the purpose for God bringing us together can be fulfilled. And our marriage experiences won't just be, I survived for 32 years, but we thrive for 30, 32 years. I'll leave you with these last principles 
clearly Adam failed. So what's our choice? We need to love our wives, not like the first Adam, who failed in all of his responsibilities and stewardship. But we need to love our wives like the second Adam. The second Adam being Christ. And look what Ephesians chapter 5 says this. It says, the husband is head of his wife, just as Christ is the head of the church. Watch this. Husbands, do what to your wives? Love See, love has to do with sacrifice. Love has to do with giving to someone else to meet their needs, regardless of whether or not it is reciprocated to me. Love isn't, I do you if you do me. I do you only if, right? The Bible says that Christ died for us. It says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ demonstrated his love towards us, right? We need to do the same thing with our wives. We need to stop blaming the condition of our marriages and our homes and start executing our headship. Love our wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so, look at, jump down to verse 28 and says, and so husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. I know some of you, I know some of you, some of you had the thought, yeah, Pastor Dave, but you skipped over the verse where it says she's got to submit. I learned something. That if I love my wife like Christ loved the church, if I am faithful to execute the responsibilities of my headship, I never have to worry about my wife following my leadership. Some of you confuse your wife's lack of submitting to rebellion, but it's not really her rebellion. It's that she won't follow a bad leader. So here's our principles. Principles of assignment. What has God called you to do? What is the purpose of your marriage other than just surviving? When you understand your purpose, it gives you identity and it gives your wife identity because it empowers her to be your help mate that's fit for you. You got to be vulnerable. You may be willing to share our heart to be emotionally intimate with our wives, to be naked and not ashamed. We have to be willing to protect each other. And I'm out of time because I would tell you how Jesus demonstrated all four of these qualities. But we have a choice, gentlemen, and the choice is real simple. Will we change and end the blame game? Will we end the blame game? It ain't your wife. It ain't your kids. It ain't your crazy mother-in-law. And she may be crazy. It's your headship is the issue. And every time you, whether directly in prayer or silently in your heart, say, it's God, it was the woman you gave me, is relinquishing your headship. And watch this, gentlemen. I end right here for real. I really am going to end here. The Bible says this, that if we don't treat our wives right, and I think this is the criteria for cheating our, treating our wives right, it says our prayers will be hindered. Some of you have been stuck spiritually, and you're saying to yourself, I'm going to the groups, I'm going to church, I brought a brand new Bible, got it offline from Amazon, multiple translations, and I watch Christian television, but yet it doesn't seem like I'm growing, I'm stuck. Maybe it's your headship. Because if you don't exercise your headship, you're not loving your wife, and if you're not loving your wife, God says your prayers are hindered. Father, thank you that as men here, we can come before you with our own nakedness and transparency. And in the same way, Lord, that you sacrificed an innocent animal and you took 
the skin of that animal and you covered Adam and Eve's nakedness, which was a picture and type of your redemptive purposes and intentions in Christ, that same redemptive grace is available to us right now. And Lord, we confess before you that we are weak, that we have been disobedient, we have been unfaithful, we have played the blame game, and we are asking by your divine grace and the help and strength of your spirit to empower us to own up to our headship, to understand our assignment to walk in our identity, to be vulnerable and to take a stand and provide spiritual protection for those you've entrusted to us. Help us, Lord, to be the second Adam and to love our wives, to lay down our lives for our wives, to wash them, sanctify them, the washing of the water by the word, like Christ does the church. If that's your prayer, just raise your hand to the Lord. Just raise your hand. God, you, you see every hand, you know every marriage and every home and every situation that it's connected to. And we thank you, Lord, that you are able to make all grace abound. In Jesus' name.